Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, I have a special guest today is Leo Felice from the winery Andrea Felice in Marche, producer of uh, two great bottles of Verdicchio de Castelli di Giesi. And joining us today will be a friend of Leo. His name is Nelson Party, and he's from London and is with the restaurant Pall Mall. And Nelson asked me, I'm sorry, Leo asked me if his friend Nelson could join us. And Nelson is going to join us for at least half the, uh, the webinar today. And he's prepared a few slides about Verdicchio because we're going to talk not just about Andrea's, about Andrea's wine, Leo's wine, but also about Verdicchio in general. So with that, let's get started. And Leo, let me ask yes. you a question. Let's, uh, we'll talk in a few minutes with, with Nelson about um, Verdicchio in general and, and, and uh, its potential for sales and, and, and places on wine lists and retail stores. But let me talk to you, first of all, about your winery and your work with your father when you started. And tell, tell us all, give us a little history of the winery. Absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening to everybody. <laughs> Um, thank you very much, first of all, to Tom to invite me to this beautiful uh, webinar. And thanks also to my uh, big friend uh, Nelson that uh, joined uh, us uh, in this uh, beautiful uh, webinar. Um, I, I started um, start working in the winery in the 2006. Uh, because uh, uh, before uh, before of that, uh, my father didn't want let me work uh, with the, with him in the winery. My father uh, told me um, always in in the life that uh, for uh, uh, write very well, for have a very good hand, um, you need you need to read a lot because uh, otherwise you have more power with the with with the word and uh, and you know better how to write um, and uh, this, uh, at the same at the same times uh, when you making wine you need to make the expression of uh, your um, your soil so uh, at the same times uh, before uh, uh, to to make the expression of your soil you need to know a lot of wine so the only way for learn about wine was uh, working uh, in the restaurant and uh, when you are, when you are 20 you don't have a lot of money for open a lot of bottle of wine and the only way it's uh, working in the restaurant so i start um, in the in, in london in uh, 2002 in 2003, I started a Savoy Hotel in the private room. And uh, at that time, I was very lucky because uh, Gordo Ramsay rented the restaurant inside the yeah. Savoy Hotel, which was the, the Savoy Grill. And that was my first experience uh, to the international wine in all the world. And um, after, uh, after two years, uh, I decided to go back uh, to Italy and um, do more focus in, uh, inside the, um, the wine. So and, at, the, uh, at the restaurant, were you, were you the wine manager? Were you the wine buyer? Or what, what? Uh, always uh, like a, a sommelier position, never okay. like a right. wine buyer. And, um, and when I come back um, to Italy for uh, have a more uh, uh, um, knowledge about the wine, I, um, I, I start to work for the Enoteca Pinchiori, which is a three star Michelin restaurant. They have a 4,500 label. That's the best the collection. In Firenze, right? In Firenze, exactly, okay. is in Florence, and uh, there uh, I need to say all, all the time thanks you to thank you to uh, my big teacher that is uh, Giorgio Pinchiori that uh, he gave me the possibility to uh, work in the restaurant and to study at the same time. So all the time I say thank you to him because he gave me a big possibility. And uh, after uh, two years, I become a sommelier, and uh, the experience with the wine was only the beginning. But it was the time to come back uh, to the winery. At that time, I was 26 years old, and um, when I come back, uh, when I come back to the winery, my idea of uh, of the wine was uh, completely another idea from uh, my uh, from the beginning uh, that I was started the experience in the restaurant. Uh, when um, when um, when I was working in the restaurant, I, le uh, I learned a lot of things. Um, the first the first of all was uh, to continue to believe in the Verdicchio grape. Uh, that uh, is because at uh, that time, in, uh, it was 2006, uh, uh, Italy was uh, full of international grape that uh, we need to say thank you 
all the time because the international grape, the Chardonnay, uh, the Sauvignon, the Cabernet, the Merlot, they bring back the indigenous grape of Italy to the, all the best uh, uh, table of the restaurant in all the world. So thanks to the international grape, the Italian uh, grape come back again to all the um, to all the restaurant in the world. So at that time everybody was planting Chardonnay and Sauvignon everywhere just for uh, do something different. And I didn't believe in the grape because uh, my idea uh, was that it's not a grape that make the wine, but it's the soil. So at 100% uh, I was all the time thinking about Verdicchio. Verdicchio, Verdicchio. Uh, I, I am in the um, one of the best area of the Verdicchio. I am uh, between uh, Matelica and Iesi. If we can uh, give, uh, just uh, for, to explain very easy, um, we can compare the Matelica to Barbaresco and Iesi to Barolo, if you want to, to do something very easy for people to uh, make understand. The only di different area, but with the same grape. Matelica is inside the mountain, and Iesi is in front of the sea. So, uh, how, Matelica, how far are your vineyards? How, how many meters from the sea are your vineyards? Uh, my, vi my, my, my vineyards are between 400 meters to 600 meters to the sea level. Okay. Because uh, we decided uh, uh, to make uh, two different wine. Uh, the first one is the Andrea Felici and is the, is the Cuvée, is the blend of all the vineyards that uh, we have in the village of Apirio. So it uh, are made from the vineyard from 400 meters to 600 meters. And the, the other wine is the Reserva. And uh, we make the Reserva, which is the name is Vigna, il Cantico la Figura, which is the, the name, it means that il Cantico, because it's in Contrada San Francisco, and Figura, because the, 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 it's the big church in Apirio, so it is, it is coming from Apiro. So our idea was to make the, um, the, the important uh, things about the Grand Cru, because the, the, the Andrea Felici is the Cuvée, but the Cantico, the Reserve is the single vineyard. So all the grape are coming from the Cantico La Figura, and the name of the wine is Vigna Cantico La Figura. That means that all the grape are coming from that, uh, from that vineyard. We're gonna, so let me, stop, let me stop you for a minute. We have a whole hour, so I don't want to rush yeah. through this. So, uh, absolutely. Uh, I want to talk to Nelson a little bit, and we'll we'll, we'll get to your specific wines in, in a few minutes. But uh, Nelson prepared a couple slides about Verdicchio in general, and uh, let me start off, Nelson, by saying that last year in Chicago at an event, they had an Italian journalist come in, and he asked me about you know what he thought were were popular Italian wines in America. And I love Verdicchio, and, and not only what was popular, but he wanted to know, you know, what did not sell. And I mentioned that if you found more than one Verdicchio on a wine list in America, even the best Italian restaurants, it would be nothing short of a miracle. It just is, and I think it's a shame. So t tell me, I hope that the situation is better in London. Tell me about the situation in London, and then you have a couple of slides as well about Verdicchio and about the, the history of that. Um, I mean, the, the situation has not changed. I, am, I don't know, I'm, I have a few ideas about it. I think that Verdicchio is spending, you know, most of the energies about what's happening inside Verdicchio. When we talk about producer, there are not Ampelio Bucci and Leopardo Felici. Everyone is thinking about singular things ab about the area. They are not making literally any change. Okay. So most of the thoughts of the producer is just like, oh, maybe our area of production will need to be bigger or smaller, but they're not thinking about doing like, a, I don't know, a, a host show or something like that, or calling, you know, a big critic. They're just most, they, they don't have that bigger picture yet. I think that's, and that's the reason why you don't have it. They're so scared of the supermarket idea of Verdicchio that, by the way, in, I don't think the US or the UK has the idea of, you know, Verdicchio as a supermarket wine. They have no, no. no idea of Verdicchio no. at all. But they are so scared yes. because, uh, and that's what really blocks the production for me. Okay. Did you have, you had a couple slides. Did you want to put those up and talk uh, about this? Yeah, um, I, I tried to share the screen. Apparently, uh, I right. cannot, this, but I can, I can just. I, I can put them up, so. Oh, yeah, fantastic. Yeah, that would yeah. be great. Um, so. Hello yeah, everyone, uh, okay. yeah, just uh, quickly, I'm Nelson Pari, I'm the event supervisor sommelier of 67 Palma, is the biggest private wine club in the world, and is run by Master Sommelier Ronan, uh, Ronan Saburn, which, by the way, I think it was uh, the head of the Gordon Ramsay restaurants at the time Leopardo was Yeah, working. yeah, okay. <laughs> That's uh, funnily enough. Um, <laughs> so, 
uh, basically, me and a colleague of mine, which is Federico Mocha, we do uh, some, uh, you know, uh, master classes about Italian wines, and we spend a good bunch of times in Verdicchio just to understand how can we present this thing to an external market. So what you have now here is, let's say, the first draft of a study that we are doing. Because, you know, like people are trying to describe to us Verdicchio many, many times, but still, I don't think neither the producers have the idea of the potential that Verdicchio has. So just to give you an idea, Verdicchio is technically a spin-off of famous international grape varieties. Now, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to guide you through every single one really quickly, just to give you an idea of how the production goes and how can you do that. So, for example, when it's really young, in cold vintages, you have the same minerality of Chablis because the potassium, uh, basically the, the pH of Verdicchio is really high. And even when you are in the stainless steel tank, this, this uh, pH goes even to create loads of potassium that creates a sort of salinity, salinity that mixes with the minerality. Okay. So technically what you have is that when you have like, a, let's say right now, the 2018 till the 2016 are literally smelling like shabby. Uh, but also, uh, when the aging starts, there's a, basically, Verdicchio is always like a bitter almond finish, where uh, when it ages, it, it basically turns into a sort of a really soft vanilla that reminds a lot of this kind of newcomer producer from Sonoma Coast, like Faila Kuch. So it's, it's really interesting how also with age, it transforms itself just as a Chardonnay. Also, when a uh, vintage is really rainy, and this is quite rare. Uh, Verdicchio tends to lose loads of the varietal character. And uh, basically, um, we open a lot of old crooks. And uh, like what I imagine an old Verdicchio in these rare vintages is exactly like having like a Krug 1990 without any bubbles in it. OK. Um, another thing is that uh, the hydrocarbons very you find in Riesling appears naturally in Verdicchio every single time, no matter in which part of the map you're coming from. So technically, there are some people that are drunk, some old Villa Buccis that they say like, oh, it sounds like, a, you know, it's, it, it tastes like a dry mozo. Right, right. And, uh, and funnily enough, we also found out that in warm vintages, around five to 10 years, it has that kind of classic Marsan Roussan Californian style, like on the lamb from, uh, uh, now I forgot the name, is the classic Sine Qua Non. Sine Qua Non, I think, yes. Kind of, yeah, it does have a kind of super huge ripe character. Uh, which in cool vintages transforms itself in a sort of like Schoenen Brand from South Africa. And most of the wines uh, from uh, Leopardo in specific cool vintages, when they start to age, they tend to have that kind of like a double A Badenhorst character, but with the tartness of the old world, which is something that I never tasted before. Uh, super rare. Uh, when people, because for example, Verdicchio is mostly an oxi made in oxidative character, but there are a few people that are trying to, you know, contact, like limit the contact with the oxygen. Leopardo is one of them. Who goes really extreme? There's one guy called Roberto Cantori that is doing an extreme reduction and basically he found out a way to take out the phenolic part and make it a Sauvignon Blanc. But because you have that kind of vanilla thing, bitter almond, it becomes more like a New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, but like a Ripon or that kind of like South Island fish. And okay. which is where Leopardo, I think, wants to concentrate, there is a super rare moment in which uh, that kind of Chardonnay percourse that it does, you know, from Chablis to Sonoma Coast to Coteau Champenois, eventually, and uh, 2003 from Leopardo and Villabuccio are the perfect example, reaches the level of Amerso from Coche d'Uri. That means that you have that sort of um, still, um, let's say, ethereal part of the Chardonnay. So it tastes like a fresh air, but with all that kind of popcorn idea, super fresh. And that's a thing that is really rare. But I can tell you that if you, I don't know how many bottles are around, but if you can find a no free from Villa Buccio or a no free Cantico from Leopardo, you will have that costuri style. That's so. That's that's in, and, and well, certainly those wines age well enough. I think that's one thing that we that it always mystifies me as to why this wine isn't more purchased by sommeliers around the world. Because here's something they would love to talk about and sell to their customers. Because Verdicchio ages as well as any white wine, not only in Italy but maybe in the world. 
in the world. No, absolutely. Actually, I will say that Verdicchio Riserva doesn't come to be interesting uh, in the first 10 years. We, we right. actually found out that, yeah, that the real Verdicchio, when Verdicchio starts to be like, okay, now we get it, it's after 10 years for the Riserva. Uh, but you know, it depends also on producers, but mostly right, right. for the quality producer. And you know what is another thing, especially if there's any sommelier here. The good thing is that everything that is in this chart is not just uh, as a single thing. These qualities are mixed together most of the time. And I always say one thing, uh, think about the versatility, that you, the versatility that you can have with food. Let's say you have a tempura oyster. If you have a tempura oyster, you have a problem because you have the oyster steel, so you need a chablis, but right. you have also the tempura style. So what are you gonna do? At that point you need or a Riesling, but that Riesling needs to be high in hydrocarbons and at the same time high minerality, which is really rare because usually only one part goes out, or you need a chablis with a high content of minerality with no prior oak, or some like minor style like Louis Michel, Bouteau. Verdicchio is the only grape that gives you both if you get the right vintage and the right producer. And you can basically mix. You can have some vintage, some producer, but like a mix of Sauvignon Blanc and Chenin, some is Chenin and Coteau Champenois, some Sonoma and New Zealand. It's, it's probably the most powerful grape variety in the world regarding this kind of spin-off character, for me at least. Interesting. This is, I love this chart. This is fascinating. I, I, uh, I'm going to, I'm doing a lecture on, on Marque in a few months here in the United States, and uh, I'm not going to copy this. I mean, but, but just, yeah, no, it, go for it. no, 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 but it just gives me some ideas and it's just, it's just one more fascinating thing, actually more than one more fascinating thing about Fredicchio, but you also have a couple of slides here about some, a little bit of yeah, history. Just, uh, now we're going to talk with Leopardo and um, I just want to leave you guys uh, just giving you an idea of how far Verdicchio has gone because there are some things like it's good to put a character in place and uh, the, the point for me is that Leopardo is now the most important person in Verdicchio and there's a reason, <laughs> Thank you. There's a reason for it and it's not because I say it or a journalist says it or we are saying it is because history works in a specific way and uh, we just need to put Leopardo in a context uh, and I thought to give a bit of story. So really quickly, we found ourselves in Yezi in uh, um, 1194 and uh, Frederick II, which was one of one to be emperor of Rome, um, her mom uh, gave birth in the plaza of Yezi, in the square of Yezi, in the central square of Yezi. What happened is that like she, she wasn't expecting it and uh, she did it in the street, in the square. And everybody who was around just came in to help. So imagine like this scene of the Empress of Rome giving birth in the center of a plaza with people coming to help. Uh, what happened is that like uh, Frederick II of Svevia remembered that and gave to the city of Yezi the most powerful gift that he can give to a city, which is independence from the church. That could mean many things, but in reality means just one thing. Yezi is now powerful enough to call wars on his own. So basically right. Yezi was like a state on his own. So he can say, okay, now I can conquer that. Now I can conquer that. So imagine that one day in the commune of Yezi, they said, today we're gonna conquer Apiro, which is where Leopardo is. And they went there, they basically kicked everybody ass and they conquered the place. Because basically the people, when they say there's another thing, uh, in the UK or in the US, many people ask about what are the castles, but the castles are just like the places, the commune, they used to be called castles. And so basically you need to think about it as all communes. So what happened is that Yezi started this war that basically, let's say around 1262, uh, Yezi conquered most of what we now know as castles of Yezi. So that's where the map that Leopardo started doing it starts from. Okay. The problem, I'm going to do a big jump now. And uh, what happened is that like in 1953, uh, Fatih Bataya was a big producer of Verdicchio, like, you know, like GDO, like super, like a table, sure. uh, table wine producer. Right. And in 1953, they had a the problem of selling. So they didn't know because nobody knew Verdicchio at all. And they had this mass production. So they needed to do something about it. So this guy had a brilliant idea and he said, okay, we're going to call all the designers in Italy and we're going to say, okay, you need to create a design of a bottle for us and the winner will get a lot of money for it because you know every, every bottle is going to be at least i don't know one or two 
uh, mila lire of, uh, of consumption just for the design. Okay. And the, <laughs> well, that guy has got rich now. And yeah. this is the Diampara of Fati Battaglia, which is what everyone in Verdicchio is scared of. So basically what happened, I can tell you, uh, Tom, that when I was a kid, like three or four years old, you go to the supermarket, you see all the wines, and there was just one wine that caught your attention. There was Vizampara. I spent as a kid hours in the supermarket just by touching it and seeing it because it was beautiful. It was the only thing that you could see. Uh, the problem is that the wine costed, uh, at the time, it was like around 2,000, between 2,500 lire and 5,000 lire, which is the amount of one, like two dollars, between two and five dollars, okay. even less. So what happened is that like everybody knew Verdicchio as a two dollar wine. Exactly. Uh, apart in Italy, but in, you know, we didn't have that thing. But now, what happened is that like we have a free character that you need to know in case, which is in the next slide. So technically, uh, what happened is that Ampelio Bucci started the Verdicchio revolution. So what happened, really easy, uh, Ampelio is, uh, is famous for his design and marketing for uh, the fashion designers in France uh, around like 50 years ago. And, uh, but he had uh, this production of Verdicchio and he had the at the time the choice of saying we can do Chardonnay and become you know, the most famous white wine of Italy. But instead he said, I'm gonna focus on Verdicchio. And uh, I mean, people were like literally killing him every time in reviews and everything until in the early 90s, when people started to have these long Barolos vertical and they wanted to open with white wine. And in the selection of deciding what was the best wine to open the historical verticals of, you know, um, Bulgari or Barolo or Tuscany, they always open a bottle of Villa Bucci. And it becomes, the, it becomes in the idea of the people, the best Italian wine ever produced. Right, right. And they, they call it in the UK, the Sassicaia of the whites. So interesting. But, okay. Yeah. We, we, we don't have that term over here, but certainly it's, if you ask most wine buyers in America about Verdicchio, you know, you know up, up until the last few years, it, it, it certainly would have been um, the Bucci. Yeah. What happened after is that, uh, let's, let's jump in like 20, 30 years, because uh, what happened is that like Ampelio Bucci did good mainly just for his own, because nobody in Verdicchio was caring about him. They were a bit, you know, against him mainly because oh, he's making money now, he points about quality and he's destroying the small producers and stuff like that, because in Italy we love to fight. <laughs> <laughs> as you know, as you know. Ivero, you Ivero, times, uh, and thank you for all the job you're doing, Tom. I mean, I, you're, you're a saint. <laughs> you and, um, uh, for a um, few years later, so let's do a jump of 20 years, Corrado Dottori is a natural wine producer. He writes a post blog in a forum online and Jonathan Nossiter, the producer of Mondovino, reads it, uh, starts drinking his wine, and he decides that that's the best white uh, wine he has ever had in his life. And uh, he puts him, uh, even of quality, uh, let's say in a, in a position where his wine were considered even better than Nicolas Jolie in France. And uh, Corrado Tori became, in the world, the face of natural wine with Nicolas Jolie. And uh, Nossiter did a movie about him and he exploded and Verdicchio exploded with him. Okay. I'm going to another jump. And uh, last year, Leopardo Felici uh, wins for Il Gambero Rosso Best Winemaker of the Year. Now, this is just a plain move because what is the difference between the three? Ampelio Bucci wasn't doing anything for Verdicchio as a whole. His job was just trying to understand if Verdicchio was capable of quality and aging. Okay. And he succeeded at that, but that's his job. When you drink Villa Bucci, most of the time people don't even consider it as Verdicchio. They just call him Villa Bucci and that's it. Right. And just because his goal was quality. Corrado Dottori doesn't care about Verdicchio. If you talk to him, he jokes about it because Verdicchio is just the grape that he has. But his point is that he thinks that the grape variety as his own is a limit. So, you know, like sometimes I say, you know, if you macerate all the wines, the wines might be all the same. And he said to me, yeah, but even if you put Verdicchio on his own as a varietal, all the wines are going to be the same. And he has a point in it, you know, in, in his philosophy. But his main core is not about Verdicchio. It's not about, it's just about terroir on his own. So in this way, you can see Ampelio Bucci represents quality. Corrado Dottori represents the natural wine movement, but Leopardo Felici represents Verdicchio 
terroir and the single linear concept of Burgundy in Verdicchio. So this is why uh, drinking the wines of Leopardo Felici is now more important than ever. And every time, especially at 67 Palmal, we make sure that we have both the base and the Reserva because it's a story that needs to be told. And I hope that this little chat put uh, what you're going to say next in a, in a bigger context, I hope. Okay. So thank you very much for the time, Tom. Oh, well, thank you. Let me ask you super, one, super one, question. one question before you go, Nelson. But I, yeah, absolutely. Uh, what's the production um, with Dorado Cor Corrado? I've not had his wines, I'm sorry to say. I'll have to look for them. Uh, which one? Of Corrado Tori. Uh, um, I think he's really, really small because he's, he's a sort of the garagist of, um, of Verdicchio. So, and uh, most of the production are going under floor. So basically, he has like the, like the line as, uh, as a sherry. Um, so sometimes the floor doesn't happen or, you know, he's trying to do some soleras. So the production is really small and apparently doesn't even have enough wine to do verticals or stuff. So I think really? that, okay. uh, yeah, the, um, his main bottle is called Jeremy. And I think it's a really, really, really small production. It's, it's, it's super rare. It's, you know, it's already achieved that kind of like legendary bottle of market. So kind of. Kind of like Acomasso Barolo or something like that. So, exactly, yeah. exactly. It's exactly okay. the same. It's exactly All right, the same. I have to look for that. And, and last, also with that bottle from Fazio Battaglia, I mean, there was another bottle that was shaped like a fish. Is that correct? Yes, I don't remember the name of it. Yeah, uh, I, don't it. I think I think it actually was in the, because I was reading, there's a PDF that you can find online, I don't remember where, with all the designs that they were sent okay. to Fazio Battaglia. And I think that the fish, was in there, but I think you know. I mean, it would be yeah, we, hilarious. <laughs> yeah, we had that in the United States. I remember back in the eighties when you found three Italian whites. One was Suave Bola, one right, was, yeah, yeah, yeah. One was Corvo Bianco, and then okay. there was the the, the, the Verdicchio fish bottle. And uh, I talked with one producer from the south, who I will not mention. I won't mention the region, but you know, as to why Verdicchio wasn't better thought of, and he 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 brought that up as fish bottle, but. Again, that's, that's 30 years ago, and there's new consumers. So I, I don't know if you can use that as an excuse anymore. Uh, you know that I saw it recently, actually. I remember really? that one guy, but like a year ago, he brought this bottle and I was like, <laughs> what, what is this? <laughs> Let's get rid of this stuff straight away. No, but Verdicchio, Verdicchio I, I believe in Verdicchio a lot. But, uh, is, you know, I always say, I don't, I don't know what you think. I think that the, the first punch needs to come from the producers and it's uh, in Italy is really tough. And uh, I mean, they should be lucky to have someone like Leopardo to try to push for as much as he can. That's great. I, this, this is, are you with us for a few more minutes? Are you at the lead room? Yeah, yeah, I've got like 10 more minutes. Okay, great. Yeah, no, I, that was a great presentation. Thank you. And I, I just, I, I love the passion. That's really great. No, no, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, Leo, before we get, to yeah. sort of talk about your wines, but let's let's back up a little bit here. Yeah. Um, put up a couple of pictures first of your territory. Yeah. And I always tell people, I mean, that's a, a remarkably beautiful photo. And the last yeah. time I visited, you know, in like June or July in a few years, but it would look like that. So um, is, is this just a, 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 a cross section of, of Yezi or? It is, is this part of your uh, territory, uh, part of your estate as well, in that picture? So, uh, so this picture represented a hill where, uh, where I have my winery and where I have a vineyard because uh, um, we started to make it, uh, the revolution of the, of the Verdicchio. Now I still use Verdicchio, but we are not talking anymore about uh, the grape. We start to talk about the, the village. So uh, in our point, there is two um, city, which is Iesi and Materica, that are the big city. Inside this big city, there is all the different uh, crew. For example, this is the crew of Apiro, okay? Uh, okay? And at the same time, you have the crew of Staffolo, the crew of Cupra Montana, the crew of uh, uh, Maiorati Spontini, because every single hill where there is the castle on the top, in this uh, picture, we don't see the castle, but it's on the left of the picture, uh, is, is the crew of the Verdicchio. So this is the new revolution. You start to say, listen, we don't only talk about the grape, so just forget it, what's happened? A lot of time ago, now we start to talk about soil. Is the soil make the wine? Like I say all the wine, all the time, the wine is the poor uh, expression of the vineyard. So this is the hill of Apiro, and this is the, behind. There is the mountain, uh, which is the name is the Monte San Vicino. 
1,400 meters to the sea level. To the other side of the Mount San Vicino, there is Matelica. So okay. this is the mainly different. Matelica is inside the mountain, and Niesi is a, to the side of the mountain looking in front of the sea. So in this area, we have uh, both of climate, um, continental climate come from the Apennino mountain and the Mediterranean climate come from the sea that in this beautiful valley make the difference between um, uh, during the day and during the night. So the grape, when they arrive uh, to um, the harvest, they never lose the acidity and they always arrive to the best part of the maturation. This is the secret of the verdicchio because when you drink the white wine, when they are young, all the white wine are very good, but uh, the right. difference is that the wine, when they start to aging after 10, 20 years, they start to tell you another story. This is the story of the soil, and this we find in Apiro, these beautiful things. I was very lucky to born there, I need to say thank you all the time to my father and to my uh, great-grandfather, which is, uh, was the, the, the first person to plant the vineyard uh, in Apiro. Um, because before we didn't have a vineyard, no? you know that the, the, the plant of the vineyard were across to another plant. And uh, that it, it was a long time ago. And my grandfather was the first person who planted the vineyard in Apiro. And the vineyard is a, the vineyard of El Cantico La Figura. The age is more than uh, uh, 50 here. Yeah, this is uh, my, father? Yeah, my father, Andrea. This is my father, Andrea, that uh, he, he, I need to say thank you all the time to him that gave me the possibility to, to get only not to work inside the winery, but before um, travel a little bit, open my mind and then decide what will be the future for, uh, for the winery. Because when we plant a vineyard, we never think uh, the time very soon. We always think in the winery to 20 to 30 years. What, uh, we want to be uh, uh, where we, we want to go. So um, I think now, today, the, this is the, the lake uh, between uh, my vineyard because um, we are uh, in organic uh, agriculture, but my philosophy, I don't like uh, to, to be inside the certification. Uh, my philosophy is that uh, I believe in the karma. No? So when you take something, you need to, you need to give back uh, Right. To, to, your, uh, to your land. So uh, the lake, during um, the summer time, the lake attracts the insect, the insect attracts the bird. So in a natural way, the vineyard doesn't exist. There is a forest. So uh, we, we work with this trilogy, which is vineyard, lake, and forest. This tri trilogy is uh, very, is the basic things for make a bio, uh, for replay biodiversity inside your vineyard, and uh, this is for me that uh, I, I was uh, the, um, the best winemaker of the year is a big responsibility that uh, I want to leave uh, to all the new winemaker in the future these uh, these things that uh, you will be just not very good that, that when you make very good wine from uh, your vineyard. But the most important thing is to replay the, as soon as you can, biodiversity inside your vineyard. Like, for example, we are studying the, the beans inside the vineyard that they move, um, they move the, 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 the yeast, the, the lievity, no? inside, uh, inside the, different, the different grape. The, 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 the bees move the, the wild uh, yeast inside our vineyard. So the, the most important things, what I say today to all the young winemakers, is to replay as soon as you can biodiversity. Don't follow just the certification because it's just one thing. The most important thing is you need to give back to the land what you take uh, with the grape. Let me ask you a few questions. First of all, these, yeah. you hired a great photographer, uh, but I think even somebody with just a cheap phone but would be able to take a beautiful photo of this area. Of <laughs> but, um, Thank you. And I always tell people, you know, in the United States, it, you know, people, of course, visit places that they've heard of and they're very famous. And, and you know, the, the Verona and, and, you know, Chianti Classico, of course, is very famous because it's near Firenze. And people are so in love with Tuscany here. But I tell them, I said, you know, and as we all know that, you know, Tuscany is still beautiful, but it, there's been so much, you know, uh, development there over the past 30, 40 years, and it's it's world famous. And and whereas Marque, I tell people, I said, if you want to see Italy in all of its unspoiled beauty, this is the place to go. 
I, I really <laughs> believe that. It's just, it's just gorgeous. So, um, thank you very much. Tell me about, tell me about the climate. What is your climate like? Do you get much rain in the winter time? How, how cold? Um, uh, Apiro, uh, from 2003 until now, the temperature is changing. We have one grace more normally to the to before of 2003 is more hot one degree is more hot and um, we always we are very lucky because we have all the, the italy is like an island no we have always the influence between the mountain and the sea so we are very lucky because in italy there is always from the north to the south big difference between during the day and during the night and this made the italian grape uh, with a lot of uh, identity and we are very lucky because in some part of the world they have the harvest very early. In Italy, this doesn't happen uh, very frequently because uh, this changing of the climate that in our area is like uh, 10 degrees, the difference. During the day is uh, 30 degrees, in the night is 18, 19 for example. This uh, uh, keep uh, the, um, the quality of the grape absolutely with a lot of identity. Okay. And, uh, and this is our climate. Normally in Apiro, we are near to the mountain. We have a lot of snow in the winter time. And uh, in um, a lot of snow in the winter time. So the snow, um, you, know, you know better than me, no? that the, the, the clay keep the, the water of the snow during the summer time. Right. So this, uh, this helps a lot, Tom, because uh, we don't do irrigation, it's not allowed. Okay. So the, plant, the roots of the plant, they need to be very down on the soil and they take the best part of the soil. Otherwise, if you do irrigation, the roots of, of, of the plant, they always go in this way, they never go down. So we are very lucky because we still have snow in the winter time. And even if the summer time, we are in the center of Italy and it's very hot, we don't have any problem of uh, hydric stress. That we need to say thank you to the, to the clay that we have in our soil. Good. Okay, let's talk about the wine. So the first one is the, just the, Classico Superiore. This Andrea lady. Felici. Yeah. Okay. This is, the the, 2019. The, is it 2019 released yet? Yeah, the 2019 it's already on the on the market. Uh, okay. We 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 didn't have a lot of uh, of uh, 2018, so we are ready on the market with uh, 2019. Um, Andrea Felici is the, our cuvée. Like I said before, it's a blend of different vineyards between 400 meters to 600 meters. In this wine, we want to have a wine with incredible acidity, so for that we use the high uh, vineyard, but the, at the same time with a lot of structure. So we decide, like the whole school of winemaking, is that the, the wine needs to be made from different vineyards that okay. uh, we have uh, in the area. The wine is uh, just very easy. I say. If you need to give an example of Andrea Felici, not a match, eh? an example. I say all the time spaghetti with fresh tomato. is never boring, never. Oh, okay. It's always easy to drink all because right. they... <laughs> I wouldn't think of it, but okay, it's interesting. And because, I, okay. yeah, 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 sorry, no, no, no. Uh, I, I say all the time, that there is always, like Nelson said before with the tempura, no? The magic things of the verdicchio, I say, when you have a Riesling, we have, you have a dry sugar to competitive with the uh, high acidity. When uh, you have the, 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 the Chardonnay, you, you need to have the, the, um, the aging in a food for have more structure. In the Verdicchio, you have this as a natural way. You have the structure of the grape and you have the acidity of the grape at the same time. And this is matching together, are making all the time the Verdicchio incredible, for aperitif, for enjoying when it's very young, but at the same time, incredible aging when it's gonna age in your cellar. I, and what, a couple of things people should realize, I'm sure many people that know your, uh, people that know your wines know this, but the ones that don't, is that you never use any wood. This, this no. Is, your aging is, is in what, cement tanks or concrete tanks? Or? Absolutely, that was the, the, the second thing when I was uh, come back to, Florence, I decided to do, don't do the verdicchio in a, in a hook. And that a lot of people ask me, Leo, why you don't start to do malolatic? I say, are you crazy or what? I don't want to do malolatic. My wine are still hard. They are coming from the vineyard. You know, it's like if you have the horse, you know, Arabic horse, and you don't know how to manage it, and then you broke legs because you don't know how to, how to go with the horse, you know? Right. With the verdicchio is the same. 
you know, we have this incredible acidity. So if you do malolactic with the verdicchio, you lose a part of identity of this fantastic soil that we have in Italy, you know. So we don't do malolactic and we want to keep the wine with the most high acidity as we can. People in all the world, they look at the acidity and then we have the acidity, we don't use it. It's, it's crazy, you know. So for that... Uh, for, for that, you know, I, I don't do malolatic and uh, we do only uh, concrete tank because there is no uh, bad influence uh, and uh, also because there is no up and down of the temperature, the aging of the fermentation and, the, and, uh, and uh, of the aging is always the same, uh, the same. There is never up and down. So we use, uh, co um, for the Andrea Felici, we do fermentation in a concrete tank and also for a cantico. After Andrea Felici going in steel steel because we need to blending, we do like 100,000 bottles of one wine. And then il cantico do uh, fermentation and aging one year in, country, in concrete and then two years in a bottle. So we, our philosophy is that we need to keep the grape in a cellar and then in a the cellar, the, the only mistake you can do is only that uh, make wine become vinegar. That's it. In the, the cellar is just made it for aging the wine. That's it. What, what are the size of these concrete tanks? Uh, concrete, we do two different sides. Uh, we do uh, uh, 30 hectoliters or 50 hectoliters. We use uh, these two uh, different sides. And, um, and normally I use with Andrea Felici uh, all the 30 hectoliters because uh, I, I have more and I blend every single vineyard that I have in the village of Apiro. I blend, I, I do the separate fermentation and then I blend at the end. In Cantico we do 50 hectoliters because uh, we only have uh, one vineyard. So I okay. use uh, a little bit right. big and, tank. And how long does the fermentation tank take? Normally, you know, uh, is 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 depend. You know, we always is depend of the of the season. You know, there is never the rule. You know, sometimes when is uh, when the 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 grape have a lot of structure. I means they have very good uh, uh, maturation. When the alcohol is a little bit higher, the the matura the fermentation is more longer. When we have less alcohol, the fermentation is more fast. That is it's depend of the harvest. We never have. It the same situation uh, every single year. Okay, now your other wine, here it is, is the Vigna, Il Canto yeah. della Figura. And Nelson, yeah. I have some time on this, right? Because this is a- Yeah, actually they canceled- This is a, this is a 2013 canceled, minute. Yeah, they canceled my job, so I'm free. I'm gonna stay here till the end. So. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> this, this is a 2013 vintage. Thank so. you. This is still a, 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 un, un bambino, right? I need time with this wine, right? Uh, absolutely, absolutely, Tom. You know that um, our, um, our idea, it was uh, to stop it, to focalize on the young verdicchio, but uh, we want uh, to make people understand that they can make verdicchio aging in a cellar in, in a beautiful way. Uh, even um, 2013, uh, that uh, it's, it was a cold season, today it's, it has an incredible acidity. Uh, so um, more, I, I say all the time that they are, all the season of the verdicchio you need to forget in your cellar because in a couple of 20 years they're going to give you the best emotion. The hot season are more ready to drink but this not, doesn't mean that they are not uh, also good for uh, aging and this is jo just uh, two different way to, um, to have the interpretation of the, of the season. Now the, this Il Cantico della Figura is a vineyard so it's a single vineyard. Mm -hmm. how, how old are the vines? The oldest vine. Uh, the the age of the vines are more than uh, more than fifty years, and my my uh, great grandfather planted the vineyard in the uh, nineteen sixty two. Okay. Uh, it was the the first part of El Cantico, and then uh, they do they do the second part uh, a couple of years later. And with your climate and with that particular vine, I mean, it, it, do you have many problems, or do you have to rip out the vines every once in a while, or? Are there any pests or diseases that the Verdicchio is, is prone to? Um, I, I have to be honest, uh, we are in, uh, near to the mountain. So we, we, um, with the vineyard that I have on the top of the mountain, I have a problem with a little bit of problem with Oidio. And then uh, near where I have my winery, 
uh, because it's a very fresh area. I, I have my vineyard near to the forest. I have a little bit of problem with uh, Peronospora, but you can manage it. If you lost uh, 10% uh, okay. uh, of the production, it's not a big problem. Uh, it's, a, it's a natural way. It's organic. It's, a, it's in this way. The, the big problem that we have is uh, Maldelesca, that uh, is like uh, things inside the wood of the plant. It's like a um, mushroom. They're gonna hit uh, the food, and that is the only problem that uh, we have today. But we are uh, see that uh, we can manage man, these things to when is the time for plumbing. We we plumbing very late, so the plant the plant start to cry, and they're gonna make uh, a special uh, things uh, where, where you cut the plant. And this uh, this things is like a gelatin, and that's gonna uh, make the the plant. Uh, uh, safe uh, from from the mushroom they cannot go inside so we see that as soon as uh, we do plumbing later as soon as we have less of this problem okay. and the, the current what is the current release on the uh, il cantico della figura uh, now we have a uh, 2017 that is the, yeah 17 is the am premier because uh, we do uh, when we when we have the wine uh, sometimes uh, we go on the market with an old vintage uh, now we start uh, to keep all the time 600 bottle uh, for every single year and we keep to the side of the seller and then we we rest, we sell this bottle after three four here but unfortunately every uh, every single time i start to, to selling they're gonna uh, sail, sail very fast because people are looking always uh, the old vintage of the Verdicchio. If today I need to, to look on my order, I have order from Canada, I have order from uh, UK, I have order from Russia for all vin vintage of Verdicchio. That's, that's, that's a good sign. So what's, how, how, many, how many countries do you export to? Uh, we do like uh, 20, 25 uh, countries in all the world. Okay. Uh, we do from New Zealand to California. And uh, that is, uh, for me, selling uh, my verdicchio in New Zealand is an like incredible satisfaction because uh, I really have a lot of uh, respect uh, from uh, New Zealand. They're, they're making very good uh, white wine. All right, that, that, that must be a sense of pride. I mean, with their, what, what, they, what have they told you in New Zealand about your verdicchio? I mean, their Sauvignon Blanc is so distinctive. <laughs> They, they say, you know, that say that uh, um, sometimes, say when they're drinking Verdicchio to competitive to Sauvignon, they say the difference is that, uh, like Nelson said before, that is more easy to manage with the food. Sauvignon sometimes with the dry sugar and it's too aromatic, it's difficult to manage with, uh, with, with, all, the, with all the fish. Uh, Verdicchio is always very easy to, to manage with the match in every single kind of fish, every single kind of meat, of course, uh, wild rabbit or baby pork or like a prosciutto crudo, right. that kind of meat, of course, no a stick. Eh? But um, the, um, the things that say that uh, uh, it's easy to drink, because uh, I think the secret is the, like Nelson said before, is the, um, is the balance of the verticchio, the structure and the acidity. Okay. Nelson, do you have any questions for Leo? No, like um, more than that, uh, um, I'm just going to add one thing that uh, because, you know, Please. Leo makes only great wines. If, if there's you. any smell or any wine lover here, there's just one thing that I think usually it's, it's a problem in Verdicchio is that um, when you try, let's say like we buy now, uh, what is the release, uh, Leopardo, current of La, Il Cantico? 15. Uh, now we have 2017. 17. So 17. let's say you have like a 17 Cantico and you have 17 the base wine, the Superiore. Most of the time, if you have them blind, you might give a higher score to the Superiore. Interesting. Okay. And uh, that's because, and th that's the thing that we see a lot in, uh, in sometimes UK scoring, uh, is just because there are certain things, and he managed really well to do it, that when you concentrate Verdicchio in the Reserva, it's really hard to get all the flavors immediately. So because most of the time, as I said, we are searching that kind of Chablis character, it's easier to get it in the Superiore version. Okay. Because basically, there's a, 
is, is a matter of saltiness. The saltier it is and the more it means that the potassium has been getting eaten by the pH itself. So basically, when you, and there's a particularity of the superior of Leopardo, but when you drink it, the salt stick on the tip of your tongue. So usually, you know, when, you're, when I'm drinking salty wines, I remember like this kind of like, you know, like those kind of line that goes in your tongue and you feel like, okay, instead in Leopardo, instead of going as a line, you just stuck as a huge grainy salty in, in the tip of your tongue. So that's why it gets scored so high every time because he has that particularity that no other verdicchio has. And that thing, yes, okay. I can, I, I'm a bit, um, compared to Leopardo, but we have different jobs. I'm a bit more skeptical of the crew, but in the case of Apiro, you can tell that that production of salt is because you are in Apiro. Okay, interesting. Absolutely, absolutely. And sometimes you need to make also the, um, the, the, the difference because Andrea Felici is uh, have the complexity, but because we use many vineyards for do the Andrea Felici. Cantico in the, is the only one vineyard. So uh, in, the, in the first time, Cantico is going to be a little bit shy. No? It's like, uh, you know, a person that uh, nobody knows and that doesn't speak. But as soon as you give the time to speak in a couple of 10 or 15 years, you will see the two different ways. But uh, I may really agree with Nelson that we say all the time that Andrea Felici is not the second wine of the winery, but we say we are making two different, uh, two different wine and a completely different, different style. That, that's an important note because I, I'm sure my friend Patrick here, Patrick McNeeny, sells the wine in Chicago. And, he sells both, but I'm sure he hears this all the time of that, you know, well, you know, the, the Il Cantico della Figura is more expensive. Why should I get that? I'll yeah. just, but uh, yeah, it's not an entry level wine. They're, they're two excellent wines. So but when was your first vintage? My first vin vintage was 2003, okay, 2003. No. And we start uh, to make only Cantico. And from 2004, we start uh, to make uh, Andrea Felici and Cantico. That is why, because we want to keep the reserve a little bit more on the side of the, of the seller. So we need one fresh wine gonna, gonna make the, the cash flow of the money, you know? Because if we waiting three years be before to sell uh, the, the reserve, uh, we need also to keep uh, keep the wine, keep going the winery. So we use the Andrea Felici for uh, is the, for the the first wine of the winery. I mean, it's the fresh wine, the fresh style of the Verdicchio. Okay. That is why. A quick question. It's a, a little bit of a humorous question here, but Nelson, you did mention that another producer. I think is terrific, and it's and uh, it's Stefano Antonucci, who who I, I think all of us, if we know him, would call him un, un po pazzo. But, but, <laughs> he's a big Stefano is a big friend. <laughs> Ciao, <laughs> Stefano. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, and I say that with a term of endearment. I mean, he's, he's a wonderful guy, but I, I met him one time at lunch and it was just, he just kept opening magnums of reservas and things. Of, fantastic. But, but a totally different style. I mean, I know he has some late harvest and, and wood age things, but uh, totally different style of radicchio. But uh, we have a few more minutes left. You answered it before, but you talked about it before when you were honored with the award this year by Campo Rosso as the Enologo dell'Anno, the winemaker of the year. So, yeah, tell me again, you know, when you when you heard that news, what you what you thought, and I'm sure obviously some pride. But you also, when we talked about this before a few months ago for an article, you said there was a responsibility you had, and you really, you know, felt absolutely. Absolutely, responsibility. So in the beginning, I was, I was thinking, I think they're making a mistake. Eh? Not the right person. I only received, <laughs> I only received the, the wrong email. And, uh, and, then, uh, um, and then I call and they say, listen, I received this. And uh, yeah, it, it's true that you are winemaker of the year. So for me, it was, you know, I was crying. And in the beginning, I didn't realize that you know, in Italy there is so, a lot of uh, winery from the north of the south, and um, the, the the things that uh, that uh, I was uh, I was thinking that uh, you know to be winemaker of the year is not only you know an hours, but uh, is a responsibility. It is responsibility for the future because uh, I say all the time to the young uh, winemaker: travel, travel, travel. We need to open our mentality because we need to speak with the with with sommelier with uh, like nelson that uh, we need to always say thank you uh, to you 
and also to the journalists like you, Tom, because uh, thank you as well, because always they, they give to us the, the idea, how is the market, how the things are going, because uh, if you don't travel, if you don't uh, um, see other uh, uh, place where making wine, oh, your mentality gonna be all the time closed. And as soon as you travel, you know, you discover that the war is bigger and that you can learn a lot of things. But the most important thing is the responsibility for your soil. Today, I think the farmer have a big responsibility for to keep clean a, a part of the world. You know, uh, I have my daughter Matilde that I wanna to to leave to her a beautiful world. You know, so I think the, to be winemaker today it's also a responsibility. And uh, yeah, this is, uh, <laughs> <laughs> great this is yeah, this is my little uh, little Matilde. <laughs> so uh, and uh, you know, for me, that is uh, the big responsibility for a winemaker uh, today. And don't don't see the things in a short time. Just uh, see in a couple of uh, 10, 20, 30 years. That uh, that is gonna be the the most important things. And uh, to keep uh, the soil clean for the next couple of generation i think is the future and uh, that is i think the responsibility of the new uh, winemaker of the year thank you that's a nice answer uh nelson i pr appreciate the passion and your 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 uh, work today and your insights so hopefully we do this again soon so thank you absolutely thank you thank you for having me tom buon lavoro leo grazie mille no, thank you. Thank you to you. You know, a lot of love uh, to you, Tom, and uh, to Nelson, that uh, we need a lot of love in this world and the love is uh, going to make everything changing in a better way. Thank and uh, thank, thank to you, thank you to invite me, thank to Nelson to join with us. And uh, it's a big pleasure for me and uh, we hope uh, that we're going to, uh, as soon as we can, enjoy again with a beautiful glass <laughs> of uh, Andrea Felici. Absolutely. Hi. I agree. And, and the inside joke I told you before we started was since Verdicchio comes from the word verde for green, I wore my green shirt today. <laughs> <or Verdicchio, so. laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. On that note, we'll close this out. So thank you again. <laughs> Absolutely. And me and Nelson, white and black, and peace and, and, and love. <laughs> there we go. Okay. We got everything covered. Okay. Ciao, ciao. Thank you very much. Take care. Take care, all of you. Thank you very much.